the viewer experience, there needs to be a funnel of engagement, there needs to be a tangible point of sale. It's forcing me and my team to come up with strategic solutions with how we're packaging these short branded films. Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Lindsay Hagen. She is a documentary filmmaker and head of development at Gnarly Bay. Lindsay, how are you? Hi, hi, Cole. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. I've got to say, it's quite an honor to have you on the show. I feel like I've been following your work for many years. And on my YouTube great video playlist that I add amazing work to, you have at least three pieces on that playlist. So it's exciting to get to chat with you today. That's really cool. Thank you. Likewise, I'm thrilled. So my first question for you, you've told a lot of stories. You've been doing this for quite some time. And I'm curious, have we commoditized storytelling? And if it is commoditized, have we devalued stories today? Ooh, you're starting with a <laughs> real gut punch. Um, well, you're asking the right person because I definitely think about this a lot, um, especially because I started off in the branded storytelling space and it's kind of the world that I've continued to exist in for the past six or seven years. Have we started to devalue? Um, I think there's a threshold and definitely a gray area. And it's something that when you bring brand partners onto documentary storytelling, I think we have to be very aware of, um, is this idea of guardrails. If, as a storyteller, if you're working on a documentary film and you take that out to market, I think it's really important to identify those guardrails where you are and aren't willing to go what the subject is comfortable with before you ever take anything out to market. Um, there is a very real chance that if you don't put those stops in place, you could take a documentary work and basically just sell out. <laughs> and, and at that point, we might as well be making a commercial. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. But my answer is, as documentary storytellers, as filmmakers, if you are going to be doing documentary work in the branded space, I do think you have to be very vigilant and do your due diligence to keep your story intact and unhindered. And that really comes down to just level setting with the client up front, knowing where you are and aren't willing to go before you get roped into something where then you end up having like product plastered all throughout your film or you end up in a situation where, you know, a client is asking you to ask the subject something that maybe isn't authentic or true to them. So you really have to do uh, your due diligence and advocate for the subject matter up front. So you've been telling stories for quite some time now. You've had a number of films win festivals, numerous Vimeo staff picks. You've, you've had a project nominated for an Oscar. Over all these projects that you've worked on, I'm curious, how has your role as a storyteller evolved and what guardrails do you give yourself? So I started in film actually as an executive producer. I came into the film space, which is a crazy thing to say. Most people start as a producer, a PA, and work their way up. So I realized that's like, so atypical. I didn't go to film school. I studied speech language and hearing science. I worked in adaptive sports. It's a very roundabout way of getting into film. But I started, like I said, as an executive producer. I came from a background in sales, marketing, and brand strategy. I worked at a PR firm in Boston for some time. I worked at a ski and snowboard magazine. So that brings us to this podcast, Backcountry. Um, I learned how to do sales in the outdoor industry. And all of my clients, while I was at working at this magazine, <clears throat> unfortunately started transitioning from wanting to do print media spends to branded content and video, um, like video storytelling. And at the time that was very new. That was back in, gosh, like 2013, 2014. All of my clients wanted video. I couldn't offer them a solution for what they were asking for. And I had these really wonderful relationships. I, at the time, I think I had like 400 clients in the outdoor industry that I was constantly in touch with. So that helped me make the jump into film, was basically servicing my clients and helping them achieve what they wanted, which was storytelling. And that's where my heart was. Documentary was always something I really cared deeply about, human rights, social impact, environmental impact. Um, I started at a company called Steph Studios. Um, I knew them from the ski industry, actually. They started off making amazing ski films. I was like a total follower. I loved their films. I used to go to all the screenings on campus at CU. They had moved on to Los Angeles and they were opening their first little office space. We were just getting started and I jumped in head first. I knew how to do sales. 
I knew how to package projects and campaigns. I knew nothing about film. So they really taught me like everything, all the basics. And I just, I hustled really, really hard. And when I was starting with them, I was living in Boulder, Colorado. The company was based in LA. I wasn't ready to leave the mountains. And I would fly out every two weeks and sleep under the edit bay on a little blow up mattress. Eventually I got like a beater bike so I could at least bike around LA. Um, <laughs> and then <clears throat> from there I graduated to a, a, a van and I lived out of my Astro van on the streets of LA outside the office and I'd have to rotate where I parked my van like every three days for uh, street cleaning. <laughs> so I graduated into this EP role cut my teeth in sales and what that meant for selling films. If I was going to take someone's story out for sale, out to brand partners, I wanted to ensure that I could protect their story and really keep their value intact. So I wanted to start directing. I had no experience directing. I was passionate as hell. Um, I, would, I was often the girl brought to tears <laughs> at the office just because I was so passionate. Amazing. That's that's awesome to see the trajectory of where you've been and, and where you're going. What do you enjoy most about your job today? What about storytelling is something that you're passionate about? I, I mean, storytelling is the most human thing we do. It's the way to connect with one another. It's a way to con convey deep emotions. Um, you know, written storytelling is also amazing in its own right. But what I love about visual storytelling is the way that it can really grab at your emotions. Um, the way music can like pull at that feeling and maybe you can't quite describe or put a word to it, but seeing something on a screen paired with moving imagery and music, it's just the most like emotional way to I think connect and empathize with the subject matter that you may have no connection to otherwise. I love creating emotional connections with the viewer. And I love identifying stories that can help us bridge a gap and realize that we are not so different as we appear on paper. And when we get to those deeper sentiment, um, those deeper human values, really, like I, I want the work that I do to help connect us. Well, that kind of segues into our conversation for today. And, you know, we're talking about the importance of stories and maybe how stories are being told today and some of the challenges with telling branded stories. When we first got connected, I think one of the first things you said to me was that the golden age of branded films are dead. And that's kind of our headline for today, what we're going to be diving into. And and I'm curious, uh, what do you mean by that? What observations have you been making? And, and we'll kind of dig into this throughout the, the conversation. But I guess, why is this a conversation that you're passionate about? What are you seeing today that led you to kind of this, this idea or this statement? <laughs> Gosh, I sound so doomsday, but <laughs> I think it is a reflection of some of what I've been seeing. Um, I mean, post COVID brands are reeling back their marketing budgets. They're having to really justify where they're spending their money. And it is ultimately just coming down to ROI. So when I say the golden days of branded storytelling uh, is dead and over, what I mean to say is you have to fight and justify that work. Um, tenfold compared to what it used to be like. Brands are not so easily green lighting a one-off 10 minute short doc. There needs to be, there needs to be a, a viewer experience. There needs to be a funnel of engagement. There needs to be a tangible point of sale at some point within the, the matrix of deliverables that you're creating. Um, so I think it's forcing and me as a head of development as someone who's coming up with strategy and packaging for these short documentaries, it's forcing me and my team to come up with strategic solutions with how we're packaging these short branded films and what that distribution rollout looks like and how the viewer experience um, reflects that rollout. Do you remember kind of what year or what time, time frame it was when branded films really took over? Like it was a buzzword for quite some time and like everyone was jumping on the bandwagon and, and trying to create branded films. When when was that? I mean, I'd love to look at Yeti's YouTube channel and see, but I would say, I mean, I was selling branded films in 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. It for me kind of felt like the start of it, but that was just when I got started. Um, but I remember back then it was as simple as here's your 10 minute short doc. You're going to put it on your YouTube or your Vimeo and here's a trailer. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen is 
we got to work harder. <laughs> like, there's no guarantee that anyone's going to see the film on YouTube. There's no guarantee that anyone's going to see it on Vimeo. Um, and if your social content isn't working hard for you, if you're not putting paid ad spends behind it, if there's not, uh, you know, a CTA, a call to action or like a direct click through, um, it's just getting lost. Like there's just so much out there. I, I think brands are also realizing this, that they really need to come up with a ideal user experience um, and really understand what their ROI is. Like, how are they defining success for each of these film assets and accompanying cam campaigns? So it has changed in the sense that these are more multifaceted campaigns that revolve around a storytelling moment. Do you feel like branded films back in the day were kind of viewed as a superfood? It's like, if you make one of these things, like all of these amazing benefits will happen. I was reading this article about kind of this idea and it was talking about how back in the day, like brands would just, you know, we'd make films, we'd throw them up there and it's kind of like build it and they will come mentality. What, what was the mentality around branded films? Why were they so popular? And I guess I'm saying this in past tense as in like, you know, 2013, 2014. There was a shift, I think with the audience. Viewers were wanting to get behind something meaningful. And I think a lot of viewers started feeling pretty jaded. You know, all the products on the market are essentially the same. It's like, what are the brand ethos that <laughs> differentiate you? Like, why would you shop a brand like Patagonia, who you know has a great footprint <laughs> environmentally and great social impact? And, you know, from everything that you see in the public eye, I think viewers are becoming much more vigilant with the brands that they engage with based on the company ethos. Um, and maybe it's because there's other factors that we can't control right now, that certain things with climate change are just plain upsetting. And, um, you know, COVID was upsetting and there's certain decisions that you can control. I think consumerism is one of those things that you have a choice in. So it feels good to align with companies, brands who are doing good, who are sharing positive stories, who are uplifting community members. Um, so in a weird way, it's like, well, things in the the environment and the sphere aren't going well. It makes the viewer more vigilant with what they can control and, and help, um, you know, perpetuate some, some positivity. So that's how I justify it. That's how I felt personally as a consumer. You feel like that's changing? Do we care about the ethos of a company more or less than we did 10 years ago as an audience, as consumers? I think more. Yeah, I, I think there is a feeling of a little bit of helplessness uh living in the world today so if there's a way to feel a little bit less helpless and if there's a brand who's more transparent about their practices and you know at the end of the day putting your dollars towards something if that can help a little bit or there's a brand that helps justify that spend it it helps you know it helps me feel a little bit better so i guess where's the disconnect if branded films help bridge these gaps between a brand's ethos and consumers i guess what you're saying is like you're seeing brands rolling back are cutting back on these types of projects, these types of budgets, because they need to see more of a direct return on these things. I guess, why is that? Why are we seeing that trend right now? I think COVID was tough. Okay. <laughs> um, everything I'm hearing is marketing budgets are just getting slashed. So while storytelling and brand ethos is still super important, they need to like, they need to hit their sales goals. <laughs> just like we need to hit our sales goals to keep our businesses open. Um, so I don't think the ethos-driven films are dying. I think they just need to be fully insulated with a campaign that really helps push the, either the messaging or the product integration or whatever your call to action is. They're, they can't just stand on their own anymore. Yeah, what, what problem do brands have if they make a branded film today? Would you say that if you had to take a poll of everyone who made a branded film and everyone who published it, what... Are, is it living up to the expectations that the brand is looking for, or are most of them falling short of the potential? I I think there's some confusion um, with what that transition looks like. Okay. And what I'm seeing is brands are realizing we can't just be making short films and putting them on YouTube anymore, but we don't quite know how to bridge the gap. And so what I've tried to do is come up with strategy and solutions to help justify ROI. So if we're going to tell, go tell a short film or go tell a short story, let's derive a commercial from that short doc. 
what's your 60 second commercial? What's your product launch that tees up with a storytelling moment? Um, is there any opportunity for a festival run? Are you trying to impact grassroots communities? Really, brands need to start asking what their end goal is. Why are we making the content? Who do we want it to see? And what do we want them to do about it? Are we asking them to purchase something? Is this film tied to a product launch? Um, is it tied to uh, you know, a sustainability effort? We, I think asking those questions earlier on before we even start talking about what the film we're making or the cool story, it's like, no, no, no. Like, what do we want people to do and why? And then you retrofit the whole campaign to match that. Got it. So your job is no longer just a filmmaker. You've got a number of other hats that you're wearing uh, just trying to get to your job as a filmmaker. Oh, yeah, totally. No, I'm I'm like barely out in the field anymore. <laughs> um, and I'm, I've am i said this a handful of times to other filmmakers in this space. Like I'm having to work 10 times harder for the same amount of sell through. And I like, I like the challenge. I actually like strategy. I like understanding what the distribution is going to look like. And I, I like asking those questions up front because I feel like ultimately it's going to deliver a more robust campaign and film activation. So it's changed the way that I talk about, you know, film development. Um, it's changed the way I go about sales. Um, their goals come first and then putting together a story that best aligns with those goals comes second. Mm. Where in the past, I would just spray stories out to brands that I thought were good partners, but but I need to understand their marketing goals. I need to understand their ROI needs first and then see how I could retrofit a campaign to their needs. Interesting. Has that been a hard transition for you to kind of flip the script or flip the approach? We've had to really develop our sales materials. So case studies, um, even mock case studies, proof of concept so that the, these clients, our brand partners can see what something looks like before we actually go put in the production time and dollars to make it. Um, yeah, it's it's been really fun. I've actually really enjoyed the process and it's been a good learning challenge for our development team to start really um, thinking, thinking more like our brand partners, thinking more like an extension of the brands we work with. Hmm. What does a mock case study look like? Can you share? <laughs> sure. Um, so essentially is me being like, if I were to make this film and the accompanying campaign, this is what it would look like. And we will literally mock up all the deliverables, the entire distribution flow. Um, we'll mock up what the landing page looks like, what the point of sale integration looks like. It's kind of like if you were to do your case st study on the front end. Wow. Dang. Uh, that's <laughs> it takes a lot, a lot of, of work. <laughs> yeah. Our team was like, we took it a good solid like last past three months just developing a bunch of these like mock mock case studies. Interesting, and that seems to work. Like, do do brands need to kind of see everything packaged and pre built for them, or can they connect the dots themselves if you just hand it them just the depends. pieces? It just depends. And where I've always been very proactive is this idea of kind of delivering a menu before they're asking for it um, because I, th I think it's a great way to help solve problems um, and deliver, deliver your services as a resource and a problem solved that maybe they don't have the bandwidth internally to solve because they need to meet their overhead. Yeah. You mentioned that COVID has played a role in getting to where we are today. Do you feel like social media has played a role at all in kind of the demise of branded films, if you will? I was so jaded about social media influencers for the longest time. And I think, I think they've kind of like leveled out a little bit. Um, but yes, yeah, social media, certainly. I mean, the algorithm is changing constantly. If, for example, if you put a teaser up for a short doc on Instagram, but you don't give any context around the campaign or why the brand is sharing that teaser, it just gets lost in the feed. Um, so I think you really need to do approach social media differently than your traditional storytelling platform. Um, it needs to be like cutty, easily digestible text on screen. There has to be a very direct action or a request for the viewer at the end. Um, yeah, it's constantly changing. So we're not really putting like trailers for films out on social anymore. We're trying to put like an anthem or even a, a commercial, something that's a little more engaging. Um, and I'm also trying to avoid social media influencers. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. 
Huh. So you won't even put a trailer out. You'll you'll put something very specific, specifically cut for social to, to push people. Are you trying to push them to a film screening or, you know, a landing page somewhere? I, I guess it probably depends. Yeah. Um, yeah. A landing page, point of sale. Um, if there is a product integration, like, you know, for cert- certain bike companies, for example, those social cuts are going to do a lot better if there's a, a bike or like a gear integration tied into it. And then once you bring them to that that page where they can learn more about the product, there's your story all living within that landscape. So I think just knowing where your audience goes to digest certain content and not like hitting them over the head with something that they're just not ready to digest. Hmm. So here's another thing that I've been wondering about. When I look at the subscriber count for a place, a YouTube channel like Red Bull or Yeti, the subscriber count is significantly less than that of an individual YouTuber. When I look at YouTube channels and I look at the subscriber count in the audience space, it's very different between individuals and brands. And I've been asking this question, like, do do brands, do people want to hear from brands? Because everyone talks about Yeti as an, an amazing example of a brand who's built an incredible following on YouTube. But based on their subscriber count, it's only like 149,000, which is nothing compared to the the hundreds of millions that you know famous YouTubers have. And so, what role do you feel like the brand has? Do do they have a place? Should they have their own audience? Do people want to hear directly from them? Is that changing these days? Or I guess I'm just looking at numbers, and I feel like there's a question there. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the people there's behind all these brands are people. Brands have human values. Brands are run by people. Marketing campaigns are run by sentient beings who have this emotional connection and understanding of the world. So I think it's in our best interest, uh, the people behind the brands, to keep it human. Um, And the brands that I really resonate with are the ones that are wearing their values, um, you know, on their sleeve. And I feel more connected to them uh, as a participant, as a viewer, um, as a consumer. So... I think, you know, I, as a consumer, I'm, I want brands to stand for something. I don't want them to just like sit back on their haunches, like status quo and coast, knowing that they're making, you know, they're pocketing, (laughs) they're pocket, they're pocketing a bunch of cash. Um, Like I, I want, I want brands to continue to raise the bar um, from an ethos standpoint. And I, I actually am seeing more pressure in the branded space um, amongst some of the top contributors to continue to raise that bar. So I, I'm not, I'm not sick of hearing from brands. In fact, I, I like want them to continue to up the ante and use their, their marketing campaigns or their foundations and funds to do good work. And I want to know about it as a consumer. What do you mean by pressure? What sort of, uh, what are you seeing? I mean, you see brands like REI and Patagonia constantly carrying the torch, um, you know, and and just making bold stands, especially within the outdoor industry. And I think that creates a ripple effect where we live in this consumer society, we capitalist society. And if brands can be the ones to help drive and spearhead change, I think it'll have a societal ripple effect. We've already seen it. (laughs) There's so much control. Um, so many marketing budgets and, and revenue streams, there is a, there's a way to use all of that for good. And that is the, the gap I'm constantly trying to bridge with branded storytelling is identifying what good these brands have the potential to bring to the world. And let's use those marketing dollars to do so in a way that still (laughs) helps the brand get paid, helps them sell through their products, but Let's talk about the good work you're doing. Let's talk about the potential for good and keep moving things in a progressive direction through storytelling. I don't know if I agree with this, but do you feel like the industry is telling too many stories? Is the audience overwhelmed with the amount of stories that they can consume? And and I guess the reason I'm curious about to hear your answer is because like I hear oftentimes from brands and you know businesses all over, like they have an incredible story. They have an incredible why. They're doing amazing work. And then they tell their story, whether it's through a video or a film or uh, a a journal, an article 
and it gets, you know, it's crickets. There's like, there's zero response and it could be the most groundbreaking story uh, that that's ever been told, but no one pays attention. No one cares. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's multiple factors at play there, but are we inundated with stories to the point where we're just at capacity? Like we can't take on anymore. Yeah. That's a great question because it is such a competitive market and there are so many brands wanting to tell stories. I think we as filmmakers and on the brand side really have to ask ourselves, is there entertainment value to this story? If I were to send this out to organic media partners looking for organic media placement, can this story stand on its own as a story first? Or is this just a profile piece that aligns with so-and-so's values when it ties to sustainability? So I think brands need to look at the entertainment value. Can this can this film or story stand on its own outside of their built-in audience? And if it can, then you have potential for a really compelling film that can break the mold, that can go on to have festival success, that can go on to have an educational distribution, potentially get organic media placement or acquisition with a streamer. I think constantly weighing... Um, weighing like entertainment versus like just a direct branded film um, is really important. So you feel like there's a, the missing X factor is this entertainment component. Not many pieces in your perspective have this entertainment piece. Is that, is that what you're seeing? I think if brands are only thinking about targeting their existing audience, that project can only go so far. For example, a brand like Nike. If you're going to be telling a football story, does that story have potential to resonate with an audience who maybe has never played football, has no interest in the sport of football, but maybe there's a compelling human narrative or a coming of age story, some sort of adversity um, or hero's journey that they can relate to? Or is it timely? Is there a timely event that can help broaden the audience? If you have the ability to entertain and broaden your endemic audience, then that has the makings for a piece that can kind of break the mold. Otherwise, just make a commercial or make your short doc, but then have all your auxiliary assets that are going to you know, best serve your ROI needs. Interesting. So from a storytelling perspective, what are some elements of a, of a story that makes it entertaining, that kind of takes it that you know, that extra 10% that turns it into a really incredible piece? Like, What are you looking for in the writing room as you're working on pieces? I think you need to look at the current landscape. Like, why is this story relevant now? Um, are, am I the best storyteller? Am I the most suited to tell this story? If not, who are your collaborators that have the, the insight, who can really make this more, um, more intimately connected through their own lived experience? Um, yeah, is there a timely event that it attaches to? Like, I, everything needs to be, like, timely and current. Even if you're telling a story um, that took place in the past, what is the present day hook? Um, so I think having a present day hook, empowering filmmakers who most closely resonate with the subject matter is always going to help uh, the story shine brighter. And having an, a suite of assets that help insulate the piece um, to help build out a user experience, making sure that there's a robust distribution plan and that your piece has to be entertaining. No one wants to watch like talking head interviews and text on screen and like, yeah, factory macro shots. And there's a place for that, but maybe it's your B2B videos. Gotcha. Yeah. What do you think makes stories relatable? What, what elements of a story makes me want to connect with a story that you've made? I, I mean, I always just lean into emotion. Um, I think emotion beyond words is how we connect with one another. There's that feeling like... Ultimately, when I watch a piece, if I get that feeling in my chest or my stomach, um, whether it's elation or sadness or joy or nostalgia, if there's a, f a feeling like I, that's the best way for me to describe it. Um, and that is what I think differentiates really good filmmaking is attaining that feeling where maybe someone doesn't even know why they ha why their gut is in knots or why their heart's pounding, but they felt something. And so that's going to carry over into a conversation or potentially become a film that they share, or it's going to in fact impact how they engage with the world or the next person they see on the street. So 
I know that's kind of vague, but I guess that's the creative side of me. Like you're really just t trying to tap into a feeling that changes the way that people engage with the world. I mean, it, it might be vague, but I think it makes a ton of sense. And I feel like as I've wrestled with these questions, like that's what I ultimately come back to. It's like, if I'm going to watch something, I want to be emotionally invested. Like I want to be overwhelmed and captivated by the emotion. Mm -hmm. And if it's not happening, then I, I, I just don't care. Like I want to move on to the next thing. And that's difficult to accomplish. That takes a lot of effort and a lot of skill in order to actually create that emotion. Yeah, totally. And I, I think, I mean, coming from the outdoor filmmaking space, like there's so many projects that are objective based, you know, climbing that mountain, skiing that first descent. Um, but I'm really fascinated with the why, like the internal processes, the emotional why, uh, the why it is that people are doing what they do, what circumstances brought them to this case. Like, what is the backstory? I'm always fascinated when I meet someone, like, what is the backstory that made them so convicted in this aspect of their life? What happened to them or what did they have to go through or what did they learn along the way? I think backstories are absolutely fascinating and how it shapes um all of us really and how we engage with the world and then I love the in-between moments um so between that objective what are the other things going on in your life who's the person you're you're sharing tea with at the tea house before you go up to your final your final alpine ascent um or I, I don't know I just love the like when you go you mentioned you just went for a, a bike the bike trip like when I go on a bike ride or a long trip yes the bike ride itself is wonderful but I'm probably going to be more interested in telling you about the really unique miner I met on the way who had this crazy story and he's lived up the mountains for the last 30 years or like the amazing burger I got at the outside the gas station. So I think about storytelling in the same way that, you know, when I call my mom and I'm excited about something, it's not usually like <laughs> the bolded objective. It's the little bits along the way. Do you think we forget about the little moments when it comes to telling stories? Like, do we lose track of those? Yes, I think the new the nuance uh, can so easily get lost. And nuance is so much of how we connect with people. When you're sitting across a table from someone and you see them fidgeting with their fingernail, um, if you're observant enough in those situations, you understand maybe there's something else on their mind. Maybe they're nervous about something. Maybe something happened earlier in the day. So I think if you can take that humanity and how we connect with people beyond your everyday life um, and apply it to your, your filmmaking, that's where the viewer is smart. Like we are engineered. <laughs> we are, uh, we're meant to pick up on these human cues. So bringing those cues into your storytelling, I think is really, really important. And it doesn't need to be overt. It should be subtle. So if you had to take off your filmmaker hat and put on your producing distribution marketing hat, which sounds like you do very, very cleanly and very smoothly these days. It's obviously clear that like storytelling still has a place. Emotions still matter. There's still a lot of potential with them. But to come back to your original point of what you're seeing is those tools have to be used and, and strategically deployed in order to create a real impact in our ROI. So let's kind of dive down that rabbit hole. How do you do that? How do you build a strategy that actually harnesses the power of filmmaking and emotions and turns it into results for the brand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, just like any relationship, you need to understand your client on a, on a personal level. You need to understand um, their challenges, where they've come up short in the past, what, um, what the hurdles are for them as a partner. Um, and constantly, as a, as a creative outlet, a creative resource, a production partner, think how you can help problem solve. Um, and whether they're paying you for that creative development up front or not, I think it's always going to be worth your time. Um, you know, rather than just throwing things at the wall and hoping something sticks, it's really going to be helpful to have that insight, understand your brand partner's pain points, um, any upcoming launches or initiatives that they're working towards, and thinking of yourself as an extension of that brand uh, in how you look at stories. So, for example, if I'm working with a brand that has a new youth empowerment initiative, I'm probably not going to bring them a cycling story uh, around a nine-year-old woman who's just cycled around the world. But perhaps there's a youth empowerment angle we can take. And do they have any nonprofits they work with? Is there the ability to grow their footprint in the 
the youth demographic? Can we play this in schools all over the country? Can we do an educational distribution run um, so that, you know, elementary schools can program this? So I'm really trying to understand their problems, practically come up with solutions through the lens of storytelling, always thinking about the emotional connection. But at the end of the day, I need to understand what they are deeming um, as a successful return on investment. So I'm, I'm building projects based upon their needs and how they're defining success. What are some common ROIs that frequently come up? Are there are there some, some ones that you frequently see? I mean, sometimes it's as simple as brands just need to sell a product. Um, or we're working with a, a farming group right now and they, they want more young farmers to get involved with farming and, and sign up for this um, like young farmer um, you know training sessions or you know some of these other brands have affiliated nonprofit partners and they just want a call to action at the end of the film and they want folks to donate to the nonprofit um, it really just depends I've, of course we still have brands asking like you know we want to hit this many views and engagement we want to see click through um, and that you know, unless you're really doing like a targeted paid ad spend, I think it's hard to have um, those expectations with these brand storytelling pieces. So if you are going to create a short film, um, you know, let's say there's a new bike that's coming out and you have a short film that features the bike, but really the film is about a story. Uh, maybe it features one of your athletes. You should you should have a commercial asset derived from that story. If you already have a film team out on the ground filming, why not just get yourself a 60 second commercial asset while you're at it? And then your social assets should have product integration. Maybe there's a bit of story in there and there should be a paid ad spend behind it. And then you're clicking through to your landing page where your product launch lives, your film lives there as well. And so while your product is working, is working for you, <laughs> And people can click and watch the film if they want. They can fall in love with the subject matter. There's also the potential for that film to have a festival run. And there's butts in seats waiting to engage with this more emotional, nuanced story. And then you have brand affiliation or potentially you grew your your um, your audience because maybe they wouldn't have come to your product launch otherwise. But they've been thinking about getting a bike and now they love you because you told a great story. Our views important like that's some that's often the kpi that folks bring up you know yeah. it's like oh i want a million views is that important um i think it is but I, I don't think it necessarily needs to be views on youtube or views on vimeo um you know views can happen like i said educational distributors festivals grassroots community organizing um and you need to prepare your content to be digestible um based on what your audience is willing to give you. So let's not put, you know, a long film on social. Let's, let's, let's hit people when they're actually already sitting in seats and ready to engage with the content. And if you do have a, a 22 minute branded film, what's your four minute cut down that can live on your YouTube channel or live on your product launch page? It's a little more digestible. And what about film festivals? You've, you've had a lot of success with festival awards. What role does the festival play in the distribution campaign for brands? What what does it fulfill? What is it? Uh, what's the objective of, mm -hmm. of submitting to a festival? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, honestly, it's pretty cheap to submit to film festivals. I think it's a great way to grow your audience. It's a great way to, you can target various regions. You can target festivals that focus on different subject matter. Um, since COVID, virtual film festivals have become way more of a thing. So you actually can hit a larger audience than you ever could have sitting in theater seats. And there is, if you have a film that has emotional depth and it, it exceeds three minutes, it's probably worth trying the festival route. Um, because that is where your audience is ready to sink into those emotions or a captive audience. Um, and it's potential for your marketing team to be out in the field meeting people firsthand who this, who this story or subject matter is really resonating with. So again, it comes back to the human level. We did a film this past year where Dickies came on as a partner and having the Dickies team at the festival with us, putting on this skate event for the youth in this local community and sharing, 
you know, sharing our film story with a community that is very different. Like we did a project that was filmed in Dallas, um, focusing on kind of like food access disparity in food deserts in, in downtown Dallas. Um, but it was through the lens of skateboarding at a, a skate park that provides access to fresh produce for the inner city. And we brought that story to Telluride. And those, those two scenarios could not be more different. But what was so cool is that there is, when you bring these films in person, these stories in person to a community, and you almost spoon feed it to them, you'd be surprised the amount of connection and empathy. But it's really, if you just put it out on Dickie's, you know, Instagram, are you ever going to reach that audience? Probably not. So I think those are conversations that people bring back to their dinner table and can actually help change, um, again, how we see, how we engage with the world. So it makes it more human in, in my perspective. Is it possible for a film today to be uploaded to YouTube or Vimeo and, and take off? Or like, are the odds of that happening one or 2%? I think it's becoming less and less likely for films to just have overt success if you just drop them on you know, YouTube or Vimeo with no sort of like funnel, user funnel. I think you really do need to create uh, more of a targeted rollout and strategy. And do you think that's the filmmaker's job? Is that is that someone else's job? No, no, it should be. No, independent filmmakers should be focused on making the best film, the best story possible. Um, it is the brand's internal marketing team. It's their job to come up with some of those strategies and solutions. But what I'm seeing is folks are just strapped. So I personally, and they're under a lot of pressure. So I personally, as a filmmaker, I am so invested in the success of my films and wanting them to impact people in the way that I envision. And I know they have the potential to impact. So I will take it upon myself to create a robust distribution strategy and proposal not because the client necessarily asked for it, but because I want to try to meet them wherever they are and help fill the gaps because I want the I want the story to do well too, just as you know my brand partner does, potentially even more so because I, I am emotionally invested and I, I do connect with the subject matter of these stories I'm telling. So if there's potential for me to, you know, take some time and on my own time outside of work, like apply to some festivals or you know, submit for an award or an educational distribution partnership. I will because I believe in the work I'm doing and I'm very convicted in the stories that I like proactively take on and take out to network. And unfortunately, the chances of you getting hired again for a second film if the first film doesn't perform is totally is minimal. Yes. And that's the unfortunate thing is as a filmmaker, typically your hire is just one small piece of the project and that's just making the thing. So if there isn't a, you know, a comprehensive marketing strategy or distribution plan, it could reflect poorly on you as a filmmaker, like you didn't do your job. Um, when in reality, maybe you weren't getting the full picture, you weren't given the opportunity to show how this piece could shine. So I'm always looking for areas where I can go one step further and offer solutions uh, when it comes to distribution strategy. You guys just recently did a piece with Cannondale, and I think it's a great example of how you have kind of taken everything we've talked about and actually put it into practice. Could you share that project with us and kind of the the, the effects of it, the ripple effect? Sure. So that's a great example. Um, Cannondale, at the time, their um, marketing director in the road category, his name was Colin Keaveny. He and I formed just a friendship first and foremost. So, you know, I, I never try to reach out to brands with like an overt pitch or sale unless I know it's really timely and like directly connected with their needs. Um, but he and I connected during COVID um, and just got to know each other first and foremost, just kind of checking in every few months. And, you know, he knew that I was just stepping into directing Um he knew that I was really excited about impact related storytelling. He knew I had a background in adaptive sports before I ever got into film sales or marketing. I was an adaptive sports instructor across uh, climbing, skiing, wheelchair basketball. And so because I had that personal relationship with the brand, because bringing it back to my past note, we're all human behind our, our uh, titles on LinkedIn. Um, you know, when he had a product launch that, that he really coveted. It was a big product launch for him to manage. Um, he came to me, I think he knew he could trust my creative direction, my ability to manage a team. He knew I wanted to direct and he knew that in my free time, I like biking. So 
he came to me with the launch of um, one of their new bikes at the time called the Top Stone. And he wanted to do a commercial that featured three different athletes on the product riding riding the bike through various different terrains. But he wanted each athlete to have a story component. Um, so we created this commercial asset featuring three different athletes, three different disciplines, very different walks of life and expertise in their own right. We created the commercial asset. That was a project I directed. So it was a, a huge risk that he took. He'd never worked with me as a director. Um, and he really threw me a bone in that respect. The product launch did well. And when they launch again, talk about um, the user experience. When they launched the bike, um, they pushed it out through paid ad spends on social, drove traffic to their landing page where the point of sale lived. And on that landing page, that's where the commercial lived as well. After we made that piece, we started talking further about, okay, we featured these three athletes that are affiliated with Cannondale. Are there any stories within these athletes' lives or backgrounds that we could highlight through a short doc? Since they're already existing in this commercial, let's create some brand recognition and let's go one step further. So what we started to do is actually piece out, if we were to feature all three of these athletes, what would their film look like? Um, so we started with... Um, Meg Fisher, um, who's an amazing paracyclist, uh, Olympian, <laughs> Paralympian cyclist. And, you know, Colin had been speaking with her. She was one of the athletes we featured in the commercial. And given my background in adaptive sports, he's like, I think you need to talk to Meg. She is doing some really cool mentorship work within the paracycling community, especially in her hometown of Missoula, Montana. And she's working with a little boy named Jack. And or he's not a little boy. He's actually 15 now. <laughs> um, but she's working with a young athlete named Jack. And um, she's doing a lot of advocacy work around para inclusion within the gravel uh, gravel cycling space. And I think you should hop on a call with her. So he was kind of like planting the seed, the story seed in my mind. So the next step for me is getting on a call, getting to understand her backstory, what her mentorship relationship looked like with Jack. It turns out um, she was a family friend of Jack's. He had, he had, he's a recent cancer survivor. So he had an amputation, um, below the knee and was just getting into his professional cycling career. And she was coaching him through that career leading up to his first big gravel race. So we thought this was a really beautiful opportunity, not only to feature the new Topstone bike, which he would be racing, the new one. Meg is already riding on that product. Um, but we wanted to share a deeper story that could help progress the gravel community. So it really was like an ethos piece um, where where can we step up to the plate as cyclists? How can Cannondale help shepherd some of these conversations for inclusion and diversity um, within the gravel community? And really, Cannondale was, was so hands-off in the sense that they allowed me as a director to really get down to the root of the story and let Meg and Jack lead that film. So it ended up being, I want to say, like a 12-minute short doc. Um, we had more of like a commercialized teaser for the film that went out on social media. We partnered with Outride, which was a nonprofit partner. I think anytime you can bring in a nonprofit entity to some of these films, it is so worth it <laughs> because that project's going to work that much harder for you and it's going to ultimately create impact. Um, we ended up applying to a handful of festivals. I think we got into 11 festivals. We went on two global world tours with the film um, through our nonprofit partnership with Outride. It played at 400 schools all over the U.S. to help empower youth through cycling. Um, we had 35 organic media placements. So when I talk about your film needs to be entertaining beyond just the echo chamber of like the cycling industry, I think organic media placement speaks to that. Um, we also partnered with VO2 Media, who's a streaming platform and does all of the programming for Peloton. So we had a streamer partnership for this project. It played on all Peloton projects or all Peloton products all over the globe um, for six months. We had an exclusive six month window with Peloton. Um, Vimeo, I think between Gnarly Bay and Cannondale got like 150,000 views, which for Vimeo <laughs> these days is pretty good. Um, and then we had about 200K 
uh, engagement and views on social media. The film won Vimeo, uh, best, best branded Vimeo um, award, ended up getting a gold telly award, and then went on to Sundance's branded storytelling uh, forum. Um, so yes, I would say that is an example of a film where we had the nonprofit partner, we had the organic media placement, we did the film festival route, um, two global tours, tons of awards, um, and in impact. At the end of the day, there was so much impact that came from this film. I mean, it played at 400 schools all over the nation to empower young writers. Um, and then Jack, the subject of the film, was able to speak, um, you know, through his some of the doctors he worked with through his battle with cancer, he is now able to use that film as a tool to mentor other kids who are faced with a similar diagnosis and procedure. Um, so talk about this project as something that reverberates outside of the cycling industry. I would say it 100% achieved that goal for us. Um, and it was still wow. tied to a timely moment, which was the product launch and this race, which was happening in real time. Um, and it's all around policy change in the, in the gravel cycling space. So it had some of those key factors that I think really make for a, a good, timely, entertaining brand film. Yeah, man, talk about impact. Like, there's no way you'd be able to quantify the effect of, of that playing in 400 schools around the country. That's pretty amazing. When I went into this conversation with you, like, it seemed kind of doomsday-esque. Like, what we do is a passion for a living, like might not have much of a future. But then listening to you talk about a success story like that, where you've told a beautiful story and it actually has real impact, like it seems more positive. It sounds like what we need to do as filmmakers and as marketers in order to have those imp the impact that we hope for, we just need to put more work into what we're doing. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Just be tenaciously convicted in whatever story you are telling. If you see potential outside of just making the film, like, where can I go one step further as a storyteller, even if the brand doesn't have the budget or they can't convince their internal marketing team? If you really care about the subject matter, it's worth going to bat for it. And there's a way to do it very gracefully. Um, and you can still support your brand partners, even if they can't maybe justify the spend. I think we we need to start pushing one step further as filmmakers, um, especially in the, in the cause space, because it's like you... If you're given access to that story, you should guard it and and then use it to the best of your ability to do good. Hmm. If you had to kind of wrap up our conversation and and sum it up for folks, what what do you hope they take away from this conversation? I love that tenaciously. What'd you say? Tenaciously committed. I love that's a that's a very descriptive. Very, I, I feel like I've got a I've got a. I feel like I have a calling that I need to fulfill now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I am. Um, I don't know. I can be a little bit of a bulldog when I really care about something, but um, it also kind of fuels me. So find find what it is that fuels you and work towards it. And you're gonna have all the energy you ever need. And if you don't have the marketing budget, I think you could probably still make it happen somehow. Just have to get creative. If you had to predict where things will continue to go? What do you feel like the role that branded films play in the future? What, what do you see? I think they are going to take on more of like a 360 campaign approach. So I would start thinking strategically about what your film looks like as a campaign. I'm hearing of streamers now being very open to branded content. Um, I know, at least within the outdoor industry, REI has kind of broken into that space. So I, I would start you know, making connections on that side of the entertainment world and streamers um, understand where those guardrails are. Um, maybe there's a scenario where a brand could fund your sizzle or your pilot for your longer form project. And maybe they could get involved once you sell it to a streamer. So I think there's, there's potential for the branded storytelling space to just continue expanding into the entertainment world with the right stories. And you have to be fine. You, have, you know, you have to find the partners who are willing to take that leap. But I think it, it is happening. And I'll be interested to see, because back in the day when I worked in print, you knew when something was funded by a brand because it was designated as advertorial. Um, I'll be interested to see in the entertainment world what will deem something as advertorial and where we will put in those guardrails from an entertainment perspective. 
I know product placement used to be pretty heavy handed and I think brands are starting to understand that that's not uh, what needs to happen anymore. We have other assets that can focus more on product. Um, but yeah, I'll be very interested to see streamers, uh, what, what the branded play continues to evolve um, and look like years down the line. Fascinating. Lindsay, if folks want to connect with you or with Gnarly Bay, where can they go to find you? Um, Lindsay at gnarlybay.com is my email. And I'm on Instagram, L-I-N-Z-E-3, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Beautiful. Well, Lindsay, thank you for taking the time to chat. It's been great to get to know you and, and get to have this conversation. I think it's a timely conversation because, yeah, one, who doesn't want to make something that actually has a real impact? And I think that's what we all want to do. But I think, yeah, maybe we just need to dig a little deeper and maybe we need to go a little further than the industry has been doing so to this point. So thank you for sharing some of the things that you've been learning. I look forward to seeing what projects you work on in the future and seeing what sort of impact they have. Thank you, Cole. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, take care. Bye.